pilgrims as we travel through this ordinary time and find ourselves on the sixth century, Sunday of Trinity. And it's our opportunity to discover something more about the ways of Jesus, particularly in the ways that he relates to his disciples and brings into our presence the uh, prophecies and the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So we'll be hearing from the book of Amos amongst other readings. It's um, lovely to have our choir sing for us today and they will be singing two hymns during the uh, offertory. They'll be singing, let's have a look, um, King of Glory. During communion they'll be singing Fill Your Hearts With Joy. And then outside, if you wish to join, um, the concluding hymn rather, is God is working his purpose out. So uh, for those, unfortunately at this moment, we can only but listen, but listen we will. And it's a joy to have our choir sing. And so we bring ourselves into God's presence, the order of service, please do follow it and respond with the words printed in gold. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're reminded, as we bring ourselves to confession before God, that we are a community of God that uh, crosses boundaries of space and time. So, for those of you at home, a warm welcome as you join with us in this act of penitence, of saying sorry for the things we've messed up. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed through negligence, through weakness, to our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon, and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>
love of God. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love toward you, that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We now hear our first reading. A reading from the book of the prophet Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see. I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very centre of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away from the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise be to the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly domains with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be, <coughs> to be homeless, uh, hope, sorry. Creation of the world to be holy and blameless in sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redeemed through his blood the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding he made known to us the mercy of his will according to the good, good pleasure which he proposed, to, proposed in Christ to be put into effect when the time reaches their fulfilment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth 
under Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of his, of him, who works out everything in concubine with the purpose of his will. In order that we who were the first to put our hopes in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promise, the Holy Spirit, who is a deposited guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. in your pew sheet it talks about the grim story of John the Baptist's martyrdom that stands in its own right but is also in the context of the gospel as a whole a foretaste of Jesus's own passion which is still to come both John and Jesus fall victim to authorities that cannot bear their goodness and their truth King Herod heard of the healings and other miracles, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah, and others said it is a prophet, like the prophets of old. But when Herod heard it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. And when his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptizer on a platter. The king was deeply grieved. Yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in the tomb. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ.
The words which I'm offering you today are not my own, they are from Rob Merchant, the new Dean of Mission and Ministry for the Diocese of Chelmsford. And I share them with you. I was thrown by an awful lot of things and um, trying to relate it to football, not least, and I just thought, do you know what? Rob has produced a really good sermon here, and I offer these words of wisdom to you today. Well, our readings for the sixth Sunday of Trinity offer us quite a combination. The herdsman prophet Amos threatened, the head of the prophet John the Baptist served on a platter, and a beautiful description of the will of God revealed in Christ, written to the church in Ephesus, which makes me rather grateful for verse 8 of the psalm, which is often also said on this Sunday in Trinity, I will listen to what the Lord will say, for he shall speak to his people and to the faithful, that they turn not again to folly. Psalm 85. I will listen, for he shall speak. Our Lord God speaks in so many ways, through the gift of scripture, the presence of the spirit, the wonder of creation, the stillness of prayer the people we are set in community with, each one of us adopted into the family of God. And God speaks through us to one another and to the world around us. When we pray, when we read scripture, when we speak goodness and wonder and gentleness, into the lives of others, God speaks. But all those things I've listed, listed, those are easy speaking engagements. To speak of God to those who know God, well, that's not difficult. To speak of God to those in need of gentleness and compassion, well, that's simply sharing the love of God that he's shown us already in Jesus Christ. No. The challenge comes when we are called to speak truth to power, when we are called to speak of what is good and just to those who have the power to end our lives or constrain our lives, when we must risk our discomfort or our status for the sake of those who have no comfort, no status and no voice. Amos and John the Baptist, one a herdsman, one a voice in the wilderness, each calling the people of God back into relationship with God, each calling God's people to turn away from their folly, from their lunacy, from their messing up, each risking their very lives to speak what they had heard God say. I love Amos's response when he is told to get out of town for prophesying against the king. I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. It is a great rebuttal to Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, a man of status and power, a man who would have dressed as though he meant business. Similarly, the passion of John, the man in the wilderness dressed with camel's hair, a leather belt around his waist, who ate locusts and wild honey. He called God's people to turn away from their folly and to turn to the living God. And he called out Herod, the ruler, for all the evil things he had done, which landed him in prison and eventually with his head on a platter. You see, the call of a prophet is to speak truth to power. There's something in the church called the Didache, which simply means teaching. It's one of the early, earliest texts from the first or second century that gives us a bit of an insight into the early church. The Didache, or Didache, covers various aspects of church life, of what it meant to live as a Christian, and also what it meant to live as a prophet. You see, lots of people claim 
to speak in the name of God. Many claim God's power, and the Didache is a helpful reminder of what to look for and to listen for in the prophet. First, you will tell a prophet from their behaviour, which will be of the Lord Jesus. The second, from their words. For if the prophet says, give me money or something else, the writer of the Didache says, you shall not listen. But if they tell you to give on behalf of others in want, let none judge that prophet. The prophetic voice is the voice of the kingdom of God, the voice of the poor, the voice of the oppressed. It is not the voice of self-interest, and it is not the voice of the powerful. So what did our prophets Amos and John the Baptist speak of? We hear the echo of their words in St Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, as he writes of our inheritance in Christ. The prophets point to the redemption of God's own people. And yet to speak of the redemption of God's whole people, to call God's people back to God, to turn away from their folly, would prove to make being a prophet rather a risky occupation. You see, people just don't like being told that what they are doing is, well, quite frankly, wrong. Abusing power, permitting injustice, perpetrating violence and hatred, refusing to stand up for the oppressed, silencing those without a voice, or simply passing by in a it's nothing to do with me, mate, kind of life. All these things are counter to God's nature. They stand in opposition to the kingdom of God. And perhaps what is starkest is the silencing of the voice of the prophet by those who hold power, whose status and identity is questioned by the prophet, who reveals that the power of the powerful is temporary, empty, a clanging symbol that fades to nothing. Power does not like hearing the truth. And yet the call of the prophetic voice is to speak truth to power. Of course, there are many claims to what is truth these days. That is nothing new. People have defined their own truth to suit their own ends for centuries. We see it at the moment in the pandemic as people argue over what is reliable, what is trustworthy, true, as we seek to find a way to live through this time. Christians have engaged in this game of my truth is better than your truth since the earliest days of the settled church, again often to suit a particular dominant line of thinking or the influence of a particular leader or thinker, which is probably why those in power can often feel confused when today's Christians speak about the same subject with vastly differing opinions. Each opinion claiming its own particular version is the truth, and in so denying the truth of others. My truth is better than your truth is not a game that Christians are supposed to engage in. And Jesus said, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul and mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. This is the life of the Christian, the one who is a disciple of Christ. As Paul reminds us in the opening of his letter to the Ephesians, we are adopted as God's children into the household of the Father through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of God's will. We are family in Christ. We're not meant to argue with one another about who is right or who is wrong. Yes, every family has its moments. Every family has its disagreements. Every family has the embarrassing cousin or aunt or uncle. But the family of God in Jesus Christ, we are called to be a prophetic voice to the world, to call people into relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ and empowered by the Holy Spirit to use our voice to empower the voiceless. We are called to speak truth to power. Amos spoke, 
John the Baptist spoke. They risked everything and sacrificed everything, even life, in order to make the truth of God's extravagantly, eternity-transforming love known. A love older than time, a love stronger than death, a love that is radically altering the very nature of our existence each and every moment of our lives. That is the truth that the powerful must be told time and time again until the very end of the age. Our voice is a gift and when we raise our voice as the family of God in unison and unity to speak and to cry out of the love of God made known in Jesus Christ, the world changes. And I offer you that sermon, especially in the context of the living and love, living in love and faith course that we're carrying, currently following in our parish, looking at the range of expression as far as our gender is concerned, and what it is to be holy in the sight of God. And also, of course, in the context of the general synod, which has been meeting in York and uh, is the interface of our um, discussions at a national level as a church. So I invite you to stand with me to affirm our faith in the creed that unites us across time, across space and across denominations. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, of God from God, of light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, who gave all things for men. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified and conscious by he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please sit or kneel for our time of prayer. Mankind, forgive our foolish ways. As Father God, we come today to praise you and thank you for Jesus who died so we can be saved. We praise and thank you for this amazing grace. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Father God, we place our prayers before you. Our prayers are for the peace for this world. Our prayers for an end to conflict especially between the nations. May all folks seek your grace, Lord. For in this, Lord, we are in a fast-changing world. Lord, we pray for your church and its people. Lord God, help us all to not judge people by their race or their gender. Lord God, grant us grace to welcome all into your table, so reflect the love of Jesus be made welcome in our lives 
in our service to you. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And Father God, we place our bishops and all who serve you, Lord. We ask for your protection on them all, especially upon the families. And Lord God, we pray for Hilary and Derek. May they know your grace and all they do. We thank you, Lord, for them and their love for us all in this place. Lord God, we pray for all our pew sheets. We pray for those in need, for Kate and Peter and Anne and Bruce and Margaret, Alf, Elaine, Elsie, Tasmin, Brian and Sylvia. We pray for Nazim, Zagri, Radcliffe, her husband Richard and her daughter Gabrielle. We pray for those who have been shielding and living in isolation for friends and families, whether at home or for those in care. Let's have a moment for ourselves in this circle for some prayers, please. prayers for all these people, Lord, may they know your peace. And Lord, we pray today for the work of UNICEF, the Save the Children Fund, particularly in their work they're doing in the Yemen. It seems to be a forgotten place by the people of this world. May their conflict stop so the children can grow and have a better life. Our Lord, in your mercy, Amen. Lord God, we pray for our Queen and our family. We thank you for her. Lord, her service to the Commonwealth, for this country, and to you, Father God. We also pray for our government to help all peoples across your world in all places. We pray for the National Health Service, for the doctors, the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, the Fire Service, and all the volunteers across this country country around us. And we thank you for the privilege of living in this place. We pray for your loving hand upon us all. We pray for all folk that are lonely. We pray for the refugees and there are many. We pray for all displaced people and there seems to be even more than many. May the Lord all seek your grace. And Lord, we pray for Laurie and Pam. And we especially pray for Laurie as he recovers from his eye operation. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, and the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. stand as we share a peace with one another. This peace has particular resonance given the baptism that we had in this church last week and a reminder of our own call through our own baptism. We are the body of Christ. By the one spirit we were all baptised into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life the peace of the Lord be always with you. Amen. So offer one another a sign of God's peace. 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 Please be seated as the choir sing our offering.
profound sound here as the choir sing and um, give a sense of this truly being a banqueting table that links heaven and earth. So um, may, may we all be able to sing in the not too distant future. Be present, be present, Lord Jesus Christ, our risen High Priest, and make yourself known in the breaking of bread. Amen. The Lord is here. Is lift up your hearts. We lift to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. And Father, you made the world and love your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising has set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you with saints and angels, praising you and singing.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you in his blood, which he shed for you, eating, drinking, remembrance. And he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am worthy to receive you, but I can say so. Body of Christ, Amen. Amen. The blood of Christ. <coughs> So we say together, Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, 
gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Amen. Well, it's uh, time for some notices, and I'm just mindful of the privilege that we have of gathering to share in the breaking of bread and hearing scriptures and for those of you at home um, as well to have the technology to share with you as well. Of course we're all of us on tenterhooks as we wait to hear what is going to be said tomorrow about social distancing and we have a, a range of um, sensitivities even in this space about um, how we're going to manage ourselves as we come into the next stage um, following or well, as we continue to journey through this pandemic and so we as a church will be listening to the government advice and taking anything that is mandatory we'll also be listening to the advice and guidance given by the Church of England which will come out later in the week. We as a worship committee in the church have been thinking about um, how are we going to reintroduce some of our services that have been on back burners um, for the last 18 months and um, what kind of church do we want to be as we move forward we're looking ahead to our plans um, sort of October onwards I should imagine not very much is going to change certainly during August and so you'll find that on social media and by email there will be a questionnaire circulating about what works for you, what doesn't. There'll be some proposals in there, some might be quite off beam and wild in which case, but you'll have a range of responses from say one to ten, one being absolutely rubbish idea, forget it, uh, ten being fantastic. Um, I'm going to be there as often as I can and I really support that. So um, please do listen up as we um, consider how we're going to move forward as a church. Um, some lovely things to look forward to. I have to say, these grey July days have just got to me a bit. And as soon as the sun shines and I can see blue, I really feel, oh, thank goodness. But this is a bit of blue sky for us. Um, Paul, our organist, has put together a series of concerts, not just one concert, but a series of four concerts um, in this church of St. Bartholomew's at lunchtime. And they are starting on Wednesday. They're all on Wednesdays. So even though I've made a typo and put the wrong date, they're all on Wednesdays. And they're starting on Wednesday, the 28th of July, um, between 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock. But you also don't have to worry about your lunch and grumbling tummies because we're serving, um, we're serving back butties, bacon butties, or for those of you who are vegetarian, um, a vegetarian sausage and, um, and a bat. So, um, and some sort of cold drink. So I do hope you'll think, yes, I'd like to come along to that. And there's a, a donation amount recommended, but we're not charging people to come in. I am actually putting a sign-up sheet at the back of the church, which looks like that, because I'm just concerned that we might have way too many, and we do need to keep to under 56 people. So if you want to ensure that you get a place for those um, lunchtime concerts, please do sign up. And there's posters outside, and there's posters here for you to take home and put up if you wish to as well. Um, I also want to flag up the Beacon Hill Rovers, the football club, are putting on a fair, a fete, a two-day event on the 24th and 25th of July. The poster is outside on the notice board, and they've been promoting themselves on the unofficial Wickham Bishops Facebook page. Do, um, do support them as they seek to support the um, great facilities that we have for um, football in our village. Um, Beacon Hill Rovers, 24th, 25th of July, and on the Saturday night, there's a night event um, that there is a charge for um, with music and drinks, and um, it should be a really good social for those who wish to join up for that. 
uh, more signing up. Um, so on the 12th of September, I know it's looking ahead, um, but we do have to take names, I'm afraid. Um, on the 12th of September, a Bishop Gully is coming to St. Nicholas's Church, and we're not having a 10.30 service here. Our 10.30 service will be from St. Nicholas's in Little Blackstone because we're getting round at long last to celebrating the um, 900th anniversary. And Bishop Gully is going to preside and preach on that occasion. So um, please do sign up if you're intending and hoping to get to that service, uh, because we're, even if we're allowed um, to pack ourselves in, the max, maximum is 70. So um, and that's pretty cosy over there. Uh, to those of you, we have got a pastoral committee meeting and that will be tomorrow morning, um, I think it's 11 o'clock, check your diaries for the time. Any other notices? No? Okay. Oh, PCC of course on Wednesday, uh, check your diaries, and also um, Living Love and Faith, we've got the last session on Tuesday evening at 7.30. So as we give thanks to God, as we give thanks for each other, as we yearn to share coffee and chat at the end of our services, um, we lift all that we are and all that we are becoming to God and ask for God's blessing on our lives. So and I should say after um, the organ has stopped playing, those of you who wish to go out and have a good sing outside, am I right in thinking outside? Yep, um, can join uh, members of our choir and we'll be singing in the church. Sorry, I invite you to stand. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and in the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you, and those and on those whom you love and pray for today and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.